Let's go into the realm of how testosterone levels and libido and erectile function intersect. Because it's one thing to look at lab markers and levels, but it's best if we can correlate the levels with whatever it is we're looking to optimize for. I have erectile dysfunction, I have low libido, I have poor concentration. So let's go a little bit further into this conversation and see what we can learn. There is a, a simple view on interpreting levels of testosterone. This is for total, by the way. Not saying this is the end all be all, but usually if you're below 300 on more than one assessment, two in a row, morning testosterone, because it will vary throughout the day, then that can diagnose low testosterone. If you're consistently at or above 300, then that tells us that you don't have low testosterone. Now, is that optimal? I think it's debatable, but just to lead with that preface, some symptoms of low testosterone, low libido, poor erectile function, fatigue, poor concentration, depression, and irritability. And there are also peer-reviewed as the Adam questionnaire, the androgen deficiency in aging males questionnaire, do you have decreased libido, lack of energy, decreased strength and or endurance? Have you lost height? Do you have less enjoyment from life? Are you sad or grumpy? This is the grumpy old man syndrome. Do you feel that your erections are less strong? Have you noticed a deterioration in your sports ability? Are you sleepy after dinner? And have you noticed a reduction in your work performance? These are all indicators that low testosterone might be present. Yeah, I want to be careful because this is one of many a quicksand wherein if you look at these symptoms, they could probably apply to almost every male. It doesn't always mean that low testosterone is a problem. There could be stress, there could be sleep, there could be undereating, overeating, poor exercise. So with all of the commercials you see for androgel and whatever else you know, is being pushed, you just want to take a moment, probably bounce some of this off your healthcare provider to make sure you're not just jumping to testosterone while overlooking what might be a more important factor driving these symptoms that may not actually be the testosterone that's the issue. But with that being said, let's look at a dietary intervention that may be able to optimize, increase testosterone levels. Small randomized control trial, 18 men who had low testosterone and really important here also had metabolic syndrome. And I'm going to tie back to why that's so important with how we interpret the study in a second. The intervention was a control diet, do nothing, or a low carb diet, 25% of calories, which equates to 125 to 150 grams of carbs per day. That's not terribly low. It's certainly not keto. It's lower carb. I think that has merit for this sort of population. Now, after three months, here's what they found. Greater weight loss, 10 pounds compared to two pounds in the lower carb group. Not surprising. Any intervention that poses or imposes some restriction will usually lead to weight loss. I think it's incorrect to represent, you know, carbs as always being bad and it's the carbs. And if you can just control the insulin, then everything will get better. It's one thing. It's one lever or method of reducing overall caloric intake and improving metabolic health. Wouldn't say it's the only one. Here's what else is interesting. And I think prone to miss representation and interpretation. Testosterone increased the total fraction that is by 81 points in the low carb group and by 10 points in the control group. So clearly 70 point difference of improved total testosterone in the lower carb group, along with improvements in low testosterone symptoms. Now, here's where I will preemptively take issue with how some will interpret this study. See, we told you low carb is the way to go. It's the best for everyone. You got to do low carb. You do low carb, you have better testosterone. This will help some people. Most namely, I would argue those with metabolic syndrome need to do something to improve their metabolism, need some sort of dietary restriction imposed upon them. Does it have to be low carb? Does that mean low carb is the holy grail for improving testosterone? No. And let's cover some data that articulates that. 
So we're going to juxtapose this one small study with a meta-analysis of 27 studies, quoting, low carb had no consistent impact on total testosterone. What's the difference? This was in healthy men. So zooming out and thinking really practically, if someone has metabolic syndrome, they're overweight, high blood pressure, potentially high triglycerides or cholesterol, an intervention that makes them healthier, weight loss, should also improve their testosterone. Shocking, nothing new, nothing novel, nothing proprietary, right? Can we extrapolate from that and say, ah, because in this group of people with metabolic syndrome, they went low carb, they improved multiple things, weight loss, improved testosterone, improved symptoms. That means everyone, including healthy males, should use lower carb to optimize their testosterone. No. And in fact, I would suspect, I would conjecture that in healthy men who are also training a long-term lower carb diet might even have a deleterious impact on their testosterone levels. This study did not find that. This study found that there was no benefit on testosterone when using low carb dieting. So just realize that an intervention that improves someone's health with metabolic syndrome may not equate to how to improve some of those same markers in otherwise healthy individuals. It's not to say that low carb is bad. I just want to arm you with the suspicion when gurus who I'm nearly positive a low carb guru would misrepresent this study. And I just want to be careful that you don't fall into that trap. Now you've probably heard of Tonkat Ali, AKA Long Jack. There was a meta-analysis of nine studies trying to summarize what does the data here show? Is this a worthwhile supplement? My interpretation, maybe. Meta-analysis, pinnacle level of science. So a study looked at either healthy men or men with low testosterone. The intervention was control, nothing placebo, or long jack. The dosage varied from 100 to 600 milligrams per day. Now, when compared to placebo, they did find that long jack increased testosterone by more than 50 points compared to placebo at a dose of 600 milligrams per day, increased testosterone by 150 points more than placebo. The thing here that I find a little bit lackluster is there was no reporting on symptoms. So we don't know, well, okay, the lab marker changed. Did you have better erectile function, better performance, better concentration? We don't know. So I'm open on Tanka Ali. Truthfully, I haven't looked enough into the negative side effects firsthand, primary literature search, but I have heard some people calling attention to the fact that there may be some deleterious side effects, especially when used long-term. So let's juxtapose this meta-analysis, which I think gives merit to Tonka Ali or Long Jack, but compare it to one using a different compound that has in my view, a longer history of use and better data supporting it, ashwagandha. So this was a randomized control trial in 50 healthy men who had low libido, but had normal testosterone, roughly 400 points. Placebo versus ashwagandha at 600 milligrams per day. After two months, compared to the placebo, the ashwagandha receiving group had improved sexual desire and about a 60, 70 point increase in their testosterone. I wanna be careful comparing a meta-analysis to a randomized control trial, but the point I'm trying to make here is this is one of a handful of studies demonstrating that ashwagandha is either good for fertility or for sexual function or for testosterone levels or all of the above. So. I share this just knowing that for whatever reason, Tonka Ali is making lots of media waves and that's fine, but if it's not the, the most research or the most efficacious, then even though you hear about it in the media, it may not be the supplement that you wanna use. I think you can make a case for both, but my preference when looking at these data 
given the fact that there's more evidence, I think better evidence showing a well-rounded benefit from ashwagandha makes me favor ashwagandha over Tonka Ali, or maybe you rotate across the two. So here is a interesting schematic showing the changes in sexual desire over time, placebo group compared to ashwagandha group. And clearly there is a significant benefit favoring ashwagandha. Now, another compound I've mentioned on the podcast in the past is HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin. And what this compound does is act as a synthetic or actually derived from the placenta in many cases, analog or mimicker of LH, luteinizing hormone, which goes from the brain to the gonads and signals production of testosterone. So in this study, participants had low testosterone symptoms, but normal testosterone again, around 400. Not to say that's optimal, but it's normal. They were given HCG. After 10 months, the HCG improved erectile dysfunction, 86% of men, libido in 80% of men. But look at this, no change in testosterone, and there was no negative side effects. I make these points just because, and as we've discussed so many times on the podcast in the past, biomarkers have merit, but we want to be careful not to treat labs at the expense or the exclusion of people. We want to look for interventions that not only may change a biomarker, but more importantly, in most cases, lead to the symptom improvement that you're after. Because oftentimes, consumers make the mistake of thinking, if I modulate said biomarker, I'll resolve the symptoms that I'm frustrated with. And that's not always the case. So we want to be attentive to the fact that we don't always need to. In fact, I would argue in the majority of cases, we don't want to treat a biomarker. We want to use therapies that help with the symptom the person is presenting with. 